Welcome to Taiwan Context. This is the show where we go a little bit more in depth into certain topics related to Taiwan. And today I have with me in studio Albert Chiu, associate professor in the political science department at Donghai University. He studied legislative studies and after being educated in the U.S., likes to apply lessons learned there to local politics. Welcome to the show. Hi, Donovan. Hi, friends and audiences. Uh, it's my pleasure to be in the show. Yeah, so today we will be discussing the recent past, present, and future of the KMT and KMT Chairman Johnny Chang. Uh, Johnny Chang reigned for party chair after Wu Duanyi stepped down after the KMT's defeat in January. Now, Johnny Chang is a legislator, a legislator from Taichung's Fengyuan district. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, elected both in 2016 and uh, this this year reelected mm -hmm. uh, by really large margins. So he's mm -hmm. very popular locally, and he, as the chair, has been trying to reform the party. Now, I have met Johnny Chang, but you actually know him, don't you? Right. I actually know him personally. I can say that he's a likable and a decent person. I mean, as as an ordinary Taiwanese, as anybody else, right? Yeah. Now I I met him I, again. Yeah, he seems very likable and mm -hmm. more practical than ideological. It was my take. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, Johnny, uh, he was raised in Fengyuan. Actually, uh, some people had a misguided image about him by saying that he's from a wealthy family, but I can tell you the truth is that that is not the case because he was. Born in Fengyuan, in a in a farmer's family, mm -hmm. and his grandpa uh, was a smart uh, kind of a local leader. Uh, he ran a business for uh, agriculture machinery, and so he was successful for that. And he ran for politics uh, and uh, was actually one of the uh, village leader. So he was that. So Johnny was a grandson of. of, of 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 the successful businessman locally, and he kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, learned how to become a, you know, kind of immerse himself in politics. So that that's that's his you know how he started his his first career in kind of uh, learn what politics is and, and things like that. And after that, he went to you know he went to uh, Taizong Yizhong, the the best high school in Taizong, and went to Zhendai University and learning IR. And he went to the United States, uh, the University of South Carolina, uh, specifically in the area of international international relations. And he came back to Taiwan in Suzhou University, uh, was as a, a professor like me uh, in, in Suzhou University in the Department of Political Science. So if you go over Johnny's uh, whole life, he's not that type of wealthy person that's out of touch with the uh, local people. So, you know, that probably explains why he's pragmatic and not so idealistic or kind of talking in the interest of those wealthy people. Hmm. Now, here's something actually that I, I looked into and I tried to find an answer to, but I, I couldn't. I, I looked online mm -hmm. and because the Feng Yuan district historically was a, was Hakka. Mm -hmm. And his family's been in Taiwan for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Is he Hakka or is he Taiwanese? No, he's the Hakka. I mean, he's very, you know, purely just Taiwanese fam from a Taiwanese family. Oh, okay. Because right. I, I couldn't find any references. The, right. the period he came over, the area was heavily Hakka when right. his family came over. Sure. Uh, so, for uh, example, Dongsi is uh, typically a Hakka town, right? Yeah. Where Hakka people uh, may be out of stereotype or maybe, you know, more, the, more or less true about it is that Hakka people are kind of reject or refuse to change, you know, in as opposed to other ethnicity, but maybe this is just due to type. So uh, in people around that area, Johnny was uh, popular because he knew the practical needs of those people. He, he, you know, he, he's sort of like aimed at solving problems, solving local problems, instead of giving, uh, providing a lot of slogans. Mm -hmm. Because people in that area, some of them they, you know, they are doing agriculture. Others they are, have the small business, mm -hmm. so they don't need a lot of talks. They need something, you know, can can be done. So Johnny, I think, like what I said in the beginning, he grew up in a farm, and he was himself had to go to the farm every day and to help his father and grandfather to, you know, to plant and to to grasp those uh, fruits. So he knew, you know, what those people need. 
So, but Johnny, uh, you know, like, like what I said, he's definitely the Taiwanese people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, because, yeah, when I spoke to him, he definitely is very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke at length, I think. We spoke for about 30 minutes, and about 20 minutes of that was transport policy in mm -hmm. Taichung City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he knew yeah. what he was talking about, which was good. Um, so, the now, he's associated with the Red Faction. Mm -hmm. Now, when a lot of people think of the political factions, they think of people like Yan Qingbiao mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there's an association with corruption and violence and these sort of things. But there's not, been nothing that I've ever seen that, that Johnny Chang is associated with any of that, mm -hmm. although obviously he knows these people. But as far as, as far as I've seen, he hasn't had any, mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't been involved in anything like that. Is, is there anything that, that you're aware of? Right. Well, actually, the symbolic leader, symbolic leader of the red faction is Liao Liao Yi, mm -hmm. the former, uh, uh, you know, Taizong magistrates, magistrates, uh, the, the mayor, right? Yeah. And he was one of that. And the reason why Johnny jumped in politics was because of, uh, there was a list later, um, he retired and he kind of cannot find anybody to kind of take over his position. So he went to uh, Liao Liao Yi by asking, you know, who is around, you know, young people, maybe well-educated, you know, at the best, you know, from United States or, or, you know, kind of learn something from the Western societies. So Liao Liao Yi recorded that there's a young people, which, uh, you know, Johnny, uh, Liao Liao Yi did not know him at all. So he, he kind oh, of recalled, okay. there's a, you know, vaguely there's a guy out there. Yeah. So, so he mentioned Johnny. And that is why that was the very first chance that Johnny jumped into politics and became a, uh, a leader for the journalism, the bureau in, in the central governments. Mm -hmm. right? The that, TIO, so that, the Government the, Information Office. Yeah. Yes, the Government Information Office. So mm -hmm. that was his very first job in politics. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if you talk to Johnny by asking if you you know, belong to red faction, he will tell you that, you know, this is such a misunderstanding because he does not know his personal link to the faction. Oh. So, so that is why, uh, so you he, know, people he, make link between yeah. their lawyer and him. And, and that was why. That was kind of coincidence. Oh, sort of. okay. So he didn't grow up with it. No, not, not, not like grow up with it. Or, or like, like in, you know, not even physically related. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, because I was wondering about that. Um, I mean, Yan Quan Hong obviously is Yan Qingbiao's son. Right. And, yeah. So okay. So he 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 has kind of a loose connection to the Red Faction. Very loose. Yeah, Very yeah. loose. Okay. All right. Um, so let's let's move on a little bit here to um now he when he was running for party chair, um, can you tell us some of the things that he was running on, some of the points he was making about the KMT, why he wanted to reform? Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was Wu Duni basically led the party into a disastrous mm -hmm. defeat in January. Mm -hmm. The second national uh, defeat of, on this scale in a row for, for the party. Mm -hmm. So when Johnny Chan, Chang ran, ran, he had some new and fresh ideas. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what, what your perspective on that was? Mm -hmm. Uh, in January 2020, uh, when KMT suffered from the electoral defeats, you know, big time. So there were a lot of uh, reflection as every time in the past that, you know, the chairman should step down. So a lot of pressure on Wu Duyin and Wu Duyin finally succumbed and he resigned. So uh, a lot of voices abound at that, you know, time and people encouraged Johnny to jump in the election. While on the other hand, uh, the former Taipei city mayor, Hao Longbin, he was interested in the position as well. So it ends up that two uh, uh, candidates jump in the arena and fighting against each other. And why the, you know, the reason why Johnny finally won the election was because, first of all, he was relatively young, 48 years old. And the well educated, which even though uh how long being he was educated in the United States as well, but Johnny was like in relatively uh kind of I mean he, he was younger, right? And also Johnny's arguments uh, about the Kemti's future and how Kemti should uh continue to reform and you know should you know find a right direction is more appealing to I won't say younger party members because there are few. <laughs> yes, but he pointed out when he was running that three percent of the 3 party of is f under the age of forty. Right? Yeah, pretty miserable. But mm -hmm. to the mainstream party members, maybe they are forties, fifties, even sixties. Uh, 
or older. They, they are, I mean, still older, but they like the fresh flavor of him. Yeah. They, they would like to have a, a new face from within the party, right? So Johnny kind of fit in that position. So that is why uh, he won the election. But it it is uh, worth noting that the turnout rates of the uh, election was very low. It was about not even 30%. Mm-hmm. So in political science, when we say that the way when a leader uh, is elected uh, is subject or, or limited to a low turnout, that means the legitimacy of his qualification is still limited. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the uh, biggest kind of challenges Johnny faced in the very first place. Mm-hmm. So he has to uh, work hard and to show the, the external world as as well as the party members that he can and he will be doing something real mm-hmm. right so so that's kind of the context that where you know he was in the very first place so now i found um i got two questions on this mm-hmm. um one is i found it very interesting that he he won by a fairly large margin against someone who's associated with the mainlander or the, you know the so-called mainlander elites how long bean is from a an old school he's the son of the ex premier mm. um you know he's more associated i would assume with the huang fuxing military uh veterans group which is very powerful in the kmt and has strong ties with china and the old school kmt mm. why do you think that do you, do you, do you think that 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 why how long being lost has a lot to do with how poor of a candidate he mm-hmm. was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm surprised mm-hmm. that the Huang Fuxing and the old school did not work that time, right? Yeah, they didn't come out in force mm-hmm. for, for their guy. Yeah, well, this is sort of a misunderstanding. Like in your question, uh, you know, you you guys or like people like you or you know ordinary outsiders, they would assume that um, KMT is greatly manipulated by the deep, you know, blue kind of factions, which is true in some senses or in some occasions, but not true in others. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the chairman election, people, they have a clear understanding that who is kind of in the position of the right direction, right? So they kind of look up to whoever is in rising at that point of time, especially that's in the aftermath of, of the electoral defeats. Mm-hmm. So they knew that the Huang Fu Xin faction, the way they worked and the arguments that are provided for the mainstream, mainstream society is not going to work you know, anymore. So they need a mainstream type of candidates. Mm-hmm. So even though uh, emotionally they would like still to choose how long being as their preference, but practically they knew that this is not going to work. Mm-hmm. And w- the reason I said this is because Johnny's victory in that election pretty much repeated, uh, you know, Ma Injo's experience. Because don't ever for- forget that Ma Injo, when he raised uh, in the very first place as a Taipei mayor. Or even before that, when he even, was justice even minister. Just the ministers. Yeah. His and argument he was, was pretty, pretty new to those mm-hmm. older people. They yeah. did not like him that much mm-hmm. because the way he performed, even though we have a lot of criticism against him afterwards, mm-hmm. but think about, you know, back to when that was a long time ago, he was pretty a new brand to mm-hmm. do those kind of uh, establishment. So, he, so, so yeah. finally he kind of, kind of uh, win in a final battle mm-hmm. and, and jump to the center of, of, of the party stage. Yeah. I, I, I remember mind Joe early on when he was justice minister, he had a reputation for being fairly clean mm-hmm. And he took his job sort of seriously, right. and then they moved him out of the way because he was getting, he was right. offending people by uh, <clears throat> upsetting some apple carts. But mm-hmm. um, now the the other thing that I wanted to ask about him running for chair is it's what's interesting is the big heavyweights in the party avoided that mm-hmm. one now in part probably because it was finishing a term. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people view Johnny Chang's tenure of being basically a caretaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to get back a little bit later into the show about the heavyweights that are going that may be running next time around mm-hmm. uh, but the period when Johnny Chang took over the party was in a mess it was a disaster right. at that point yeah. I mean it was a disastrous electoral defeat following the national one in 2016 
um, you know, their finances are a mess. Uh, and so how much do you think that the, the reason why a lot of these heavyweights step back is just simply because, and I, I actually saw quotes from some of the party heavyweights that basically, you know, right now it's just, it's a disaster. We don't want to touch this. Mm-hmm. Um, how much do you think that played into the, his winning? Because the, the KMT really was in a bad spot and mm-hmm. to a certain degree still is. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that played a big role in his, his election? Um, I think, you know, like having said that Johnny uh, was pretty good in terms of his own career development as well as his uh, performance in the legislative year. I mean, in relative sense, even though, you know, people from the DPP side don't like him, but TPP from the, you know, people from the DPP side, for example, Wang Dingyu, legislator Wang Dingyu, you know, in the beginning, actually approved Zhang Qichan as well, mm-hmm. even though they, you know, he did have some kind of criticism afterwards. But to say that, having said that, I still have to kind of come back to the normal life now. Mm-hmm. Um, the party reform and also a lot of burdens and troubles and, you know, a lot of messy stuff within DPP, like what you suggested, is really cumbersome. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's nasty. I mean, it's not easy to change. For many reasons, first of all, there are a lot of vested interest in it. Mm-hmm. They knew that the boats, so to speak, uh, is sinking. Yeah. That the boats of the KMT is sinking. The way that they would always put it, and this I saw quotes from several heavyweights, was that this is the lowest point in KMT's history, mm-hmm. which I kind of disagreed with. I would have thought that would have been 1949, mm-hmm. but that was the one right. way they used to describe it. This is the lowest point in KMT history. In recent history, maybe it is. Yeah. But actually... Uh, as, as far as I know that, um, you know, some people, they, you know, did, uh, they conducted polling every month, even every week. And also on the other sides of the party spectrum, you know, the people from the DPP, they, they conducted polling as well. Um, there are actually some kind of consensus over there regarding KMT status right now. Since February 2020, this year, when you say there's a, there was a low point for the uh, electoral supports for, or you know, just the party approval of KMT. Actually, it climbs a little bit, mm-hmm. but not more than thirty percent. To me, it's still really low. Yeah, it is low, not in relative sense or in uh, uh, absolute sense, but it it is low in a sense that they never will win back the the regime. Um, they, they they will never win the uh, presidential election anymore, even four mm-hmm. years after now. Right. So that's uh, not enough. But considering how much Johnny has to overcome, you know, within the party, it, it's it's really hard. So I can say my kind of evaluation of his performance so far is that he hasn't done enough mm-hmm. about reform reforming the party, specifically the arguments against CCP, the mm-hmm. Communist China, yeah, and uh, you know also get rid of those pro. China faction within a party because there are two types of party in this category. First of all, there were business persons. Those business persons, they might not be so competitive in China, but because they use the abuse, the name of KMT to woo those consumers in China by saying that we are linked to KMT so that you should make business with us. But that's not about their capability. All right. So those people, uh, in Chinese, we call them uh, the business type uh, uh, KMTers. The comfort door. The comfort door, yes. The comfort doors, yeah. Yeah, okay. The other parts, uh, which I did not think was important before, but after I kind of experienced some of the, some of the party affairs, I thought that part of the people really exists. Those people, even though they occupy a very small segment of a population, but they did exist. Mm-hmm. Those people, they have affection for China. Yeah, they they did not really appreciate the West Western sense of democracy. They did not think that, especially the American model, really works for Chinese people, and they identify themselves a, as part of the Chinese people instead of tri- Taiwanese people. And we all know that. The Taiwanese identity now really serves as a mainstream identity in Taiwan. Yeah. And Chinese people maybe, you know, less than 20%. But those part of people, you know, where I personally I feel empathy for them because that's their maybe from their family experience or maybe from their personal experience. Some of them are married to the 
Chinese woman or married to a Chinese husband. So they do have that kind of link. Mm -hmm. So the two parts of the KMT is really kind of pull Jiang Qishan back from, you know, going away from the China identity. And then there's, the, I mean, then there's the ones who are, aren't, they don't do business over there per se. They just are ideologically, ideologically. tied. I mean, Wu Zihuai, he comes to mind right. to yeah. a certain degree, Ma Yingzhou, right. um, these guys. Right. So this is really difficult for Jiang Qishan because, uh, well, to be fair, I think even in DPP, you see similar situation, kind of our outliers out there that kind of trying to pull Tsai ing away from the mainstream society. Mm -hmm. And so does Jiang Qichen, right? So for those part of the uh, uh, faction, you can say Huang Fuxin, Dang Bu, or those people who, you know, do business uh, in China or like, you know, affectionately uh, tied to China, you can say those people kind of pull Jiang Qichen away from the mainstream uh, Taiwan. So I think the first priority for Jiang Qichen to take care of of is to remove those parts, even though my perspective to him is too strong because he already uh, experienced or, or encountered backlash from so, within. All right, so that's a good segue into the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about. Now, he campaigned for KMT chair on being more pro-US. Mm -hmm. He talked about possibly dropping the 92 consensus, um, reforming the finances, and... Uh, and uh, appealing more to youth. Mm -hmm. Now, he once he won, he formed a, s a series of reform committees. Mm -hmm. And you were on one of these committees. Mm -hmm. And you were on the most important one, but mm -hmm. you're not a KMT member, are you? No, I'm not KMT members. Uh, to them, I'm just kind of server outside experts. I, I do want to kind of say something about myself is that uh, personally, I don't like KMT that much. Mm -hmm. And I know Johnny as a, as a friend, and I admire him. I like him, you know, as a friend. But personally, I don't like KMT and many of their ideas in history, especially uh, regarding their authoritarian past. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the reason I am willing to join the committee is because I think the a sound democracy, even some of the friends from the left or from the DPP side, they will agree with me on this notion is that we need a strong opposition. Mm -hmm. And only a strong opposition makes the democracy functions in a normal way. And of course, we do have a lot of different opposition parties, but the de facto is that KMT is still the second biggest party in the Zilev Yuan. And there's a lot of chances for them to come back to the power of the ruling parties in the future. I'd yeah. love to do uh, an, another show. We talk about all the part, all, all the other parties right, and their yeah. chances going forward. And, but uh, and that's for another show. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now the I, you know, I remember when the reforms came out. I did a show about it because I went through mm -hmm. you know all of it, and and it actually looked really quite good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seemed to be facing the reality, the ch the realities of the challenges. Mm -hmm. I. I, I the the financial part was a little too vague mm -hmm. i thought yeah um and a lot of the stuff on you know attracting youth sounded good on paper but it was who knows how that was going to work mm -hmm. but of course you were on the the key committee the cross straits committee mm -hmm. and your committee recommended and of course this was backed by johnny chang mm -hmm. um to drop the 92 consensus mm -hmm. well uh the phrase or the terminology should have been more uh, precise or more, you know, with more caveats. This is kind of the arts of politics is that when you come up with a argument or a reform manifesto, you really have to simultaneously satisfy different parties, right? So uh, the conclusion we had from the committee is to me not far enough. Definitely not, not not far enough regarding dump the 192 consensus. Well, actually, um, the committee was actually, to to my perspective, is like still approving 92 consensus. But as a historical fact. But as a historical fact. But yeah. even that was placed or was uh, written down in a very vague sense in and a final report. It was put at the bottom. It was put down way down. It was the put at the bottom. Yeah. And so. To the old-fashioned politician, for example, Su Qi or other <laughs> party members, they were 
Uh, well, Suchi, Suchi, you know, Professor Suchi, I mean, I personally know him. He's a very nice guy, uh -huh. very humble, modest, and open to different opinions. But don't ever forget that he and the President Ma Ying jeou they had their momentum yeah. in their own ages, right? So mm -hmm. they're kind of stuck in their time. But now it's 2020, and we are going to be 2021 very, very quick. So we have to move on and, and, and to find a new balance between Taiwan and China. So to me, the conclusion of the committee were, was not far enough. But to be fair, there were five members in that cross-strait uh, committee where there were 13 members in total were pretty, five of them, in, including me, were pretty advanced. We are very progressive. And our arguments and our uh, kind of debates was very productive in the committee. And, you know, actually, we are still follow the civilized kind of rule that we respect each other and we kind of articulate and we, we, we kind of say whatever we think is right to say. And in the end, uh, it was a peaceful ending, peaceful conclusion, even though the manifesto that's, that was not written by all of us, it was kind of in the hands of, of a few people. So for me, because I'm, I can say I'm one, perhaps the most progressive member in the committee, which means that my opinions was not taken into consideration a lot. <laughs> Actually, 99% was not taken into consideration in a final manifesto. But this is why Johnny invited me over to join the committee because I'm more like server as a stimulus, you know, you know, kind of a cat catalyst mm -hmm. for, for the uh, reform of the party. But anyway, so in the end, you know, we actually had a kind of convention after the committee meetings where we met up for two months in a row and was intensive, a lot of exchange. We even had a line group. Even now, it still exists, still kind of inactive though, but, but we, we, we talked to each other, kind of change opinions. But in the conference, I mean, in the convention uh, afterwards, the final version, which is the manifesto, was even new to me. And to me, it was more conservative, right? So, you know, to be fair, even though I'm friends, uh, one of the friends of Johnny's, I would say that that kind of, you know, change in a conservative direction. So then we move on to another stage, which is the uh, party congress, mm -hmm. which I personally... Well, why, don't, why don't we go into the backlash before we get to the party congress? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because there was a big backlash... Mm -hmm out of what the reform committee and mo almost all the backlash okay, yeah, around the 92 point. consensus. Right. Um, speaking of that, actually, I can sincerely fear there is a pause or there is a pressure on us. Not on me personally, because I don't, first of all, I'm not interested in talking to China. You know, that's my, not my area. My doctoral dissertation has to do with American individualism and participation. So I don't really... Seriously, I, I don't have research interest in China, so I, I don't have need to go to China in person uh, on a regular basis. But for others, for other members, some of them are just reserved to say you can check out online. They do have business in China. They have a link to China. They have, anyway, they, they, they need to earn money in China. So they even say explicitly in a committee uh, by saying that um, we have to consider you know, the, the Chinese communist opinion about, about our, our reform. They m might not be happy about this, about that. That's one, one, one type of person. The other type is, uh, for example, you know, Professor Su Qi, he was one of the members. He was concerned with, you know, if we take away the 92 consensus, that might destabilize the cross trade relations, that might in the end lead up to war, which I tend to disagree because... Uh, in the 2019, uh, in January, uh, the, the President Xi Jinping, he obviously uh, explicitly linked the United Consensus to one country, two systems, so that he basically eradicates the vagueness of the United Consensus in that United Consensus could be linked to, uh, you know, the, the uh, ROC, right? That's the Kuomintang, the Kempti's version of, of mm -hmm. the country, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, so they, they, they still had the naive understanding that, you know, CCP still subscribe to this notion, which they don't. They never e did. Even though, even though, now uh, a trust uh, a trustworthy resource 
told me from KMT, which I cannot say whom, but this is really trustworthy. Uh, but by saying that, they, they say the, the communist China, uh, after they experienced the sentiments with KMTers, because you know there was a uh, convention, right, uh, where KMT Zhang Jishan originally wanted to send a group of party re representatives, even including the secretary, uh, over to China to to kind of meet, meet up with them, you know, kind of to 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 make up, uh, you know, with each other, right? But you know there was anchor from China by saying that oh KMT they come over here because they want to beg us mm -hmm. for peace. They, they succumb or they give in. So that really provoked, you know, not only came tears, but also the whole society of Taiwan by saying that you guys should, you know, it's a dignity problem. You know, you should reserve your dignity. So that in the end, uh, Zhang Jishan, he withdraw the whole group mm -hmm. and, and, and refused to go over there anymore. If there are any individual members who is willing to go, that's their decision, that's their choice. Okay, so that's the background. Mm -hmm. and in it, actually, the trustworthy resource told me that after this uh, instance, China, they back up a little bit in a sense that they come back to the 92 consensus. And Wang Yang, he is the leader of the Hai Xie Hui. He, he actually talked about, uh, he removed the parts where Xi Jinping stated that 92 consensus is linked to one country, two system. They don't, mention that anymore even though i repeatedly remind them of the possibility that, that you know the communist uh, party would cheat it on you again and, and you know that's that's came to experience whenever they had fights with the communist party always back and forth and finally the losers is only always the, mm -hmm. the kmt so i remind them but that served as a sign to some of the kmt's uh, in that, you know, their route is on the right track, mm -hmm. which to me, they should still need to be very cautious about it. But, I, you know, I also want to mention this as a notice to people outside KMTs, even from the DPP side. And this is going on right now. And we should kind of study on this, especially the Taiwan administration. So let me jump back a little bit, uh, just for context for uh, our listeners. Um, the 1992 consensus originally was made up to describe mm -hmm. what happened at some meetings in the early 1990s. There was mm -hmm. never actually, it was, that was never mm -hmm. explicitly mentioned as a thing, uh, until the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was the formulation on the Chinese side was that there was one China mm -hmm. and the formulation that the KMT accepted was that there was one china each side with its own interpretation mm -hmm. the chinese side never accepted that and then right. of course xi jinping came in with one country one country two systems you know one china one country two systems which the kmt uh, actually came out very quickly and condemned that um but as far as taiwan dropping the 92 consensus that effectively happened with the with that leading to war is that mm -hmm. Tsai Ing-wen dropped it in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Taiwan's been without it for a while now. But when 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 the committee that you were on and Johnny Chang came out with dropping the 92 consensus going forward, the backlash seemed to be led by it was Ma Ying-jeou, mm -hmm. uh, Su Qi and uh, and what, what I found very interesting, Han Guoyu is one of these opposed to it is the split between who stepped up and supported Johnny Chang mm -hmm. as KMT chair, although not one of them said anything about the 1992 consensus. Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of talk about removing Johnny Chang at the time, I remember, mm -hmm. before the party congress in September. Right. And uh, the ones who stood up and the ones who were against him, I thought was a very interesting split. Mm -hmm. The ones that that were against him generally were associated with the what were so-called mainlander elites. Mm -hmm. And the ones that stood up for him were Hou Youyi, yeah. Zhu Lilun, right. uh, that's Eric Chu, mm -hmm. and Wang Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, two of those three are Taiwanese and the other one's half Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, n- none of them said anything really about the 92 consensus, but they said, you know, Johnny Chang's doing a great job. Mm-hmm. He's working really hard. Ta han xing ku, is the way mm-hmm. Eric Chu would put it. Um, so uh, what do you, what, do you have any thoughts on the split between who supported him, who didn't, and how no challenges actually came up to right. remove him during the party congress? Mm-hmm. Okay, first of all, the survival of Johnny, uh, you know, to continue his job as a chairman is to compromise, mm-hmm. more or less, right? Compromise to the direction of men and their elites, as you mentioned. But if he compromised too much, he will lose a lot of reformer mindset type of party members and even outsiders, and ordinary younger, younger voters, younger voters mm-hmm. even though there are not many already so he has to strike a balance between the two powers kind of two factions yes you could probably fit all the young kmt supporters into a bus yeah i hope i hope yeah (laughs) right so so he has to kind of kind of make a you know strike a balance between the two sides right so and also the second observation that we should have is that the the Elites you mentioned, er- Eric Zhu, uh, Han Guoyu, uh, even uh, Wang Jinping, uh, even you know like New Taipei Mayor Hou Youyi and the former New Taipei Mayor Zhou Xiwei, right, and even Ma Yingzhou, they all have their calculation, right. I mean, who doesn't? Even in DPP, you you think about uh, uh, Tsai Ing Wen and also other political elites, they have their own calculation, and so do those people in. KMT. But the thing for KMT to me, the most urgent problem for them is that they even had even have had a chance to win an election and they started fights already. You know, it's it makes sense that you start fight against each other after you re- they win an election because the resources are abundant, right? You you have a lot of uh personnel post, you can assign your own person to be in that position to, to be in this position. But given the fact that KMT is such a minority party, mm-hmm. right? They are, uh, as a position party, they have limited resources. Even the party assets is pretty much deprived or pretty much taken away or pretty much calculated, whatever term you use, by the ruling party. You know, but they still, those old folks, those old politicians, they're still thinking about when and how they can come back to the ruling position. I mean, I'm not a ruling of the country, but a ruling of the, com- the party, right? Yeah, so let's get back to that topic okay, sure. in a minute. Okay, so, yeah. sure. So they have to kind of use Johnny, Zhang, the chairman, as a tool, you know, to, to kind of, uh, first of all, to show how they are thinking of the whole picture because they do not want to dump Zhang, uh, Johnny uh, for the second because they thought Johnny is, is pretty hardworking and, and so on and so forth, right? Also, they want to win the support for, for, for Johnny because, first of all, some of the can, candidates, for example, Eric Zhu especially, mm-hmm. he is craving for the chairman uh, election next year, mm-hmm. May 20, right? So, so they he moved it to August, actually. August election. Yeah, they moved it from, next year. They moved oh, from, it from, from May, May to August. 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 That yeah, was right. at the yeah. last party congress. They changed the date. Right. Yeah. Okay. August. But you know, it's still the situation still remains the same. Mm-hmm. The factional fights will continue even longer, right? Yes. If that's the case. Okay. So Eric, Eric Drew, he's he's craving for that position, and he thought maybe Johnny could be his assistant, right? Mm-hmm. And Drew did not actually. Drew broke up with Hou Youyi, and Hou Youyi was one of his subjects. Mm-hmm. Right, and Hoyo is rising really quick and really standing in the center of this party spectrum. Actually, Hoyo is one of the most popular, actually, the most He's popular, the most popular, the popular can, uh, candidates within the KMT, right? By far, by far, <laughs> right? By far. So he's very really smart. Mm-hmm. So Zhu and Ho they broke up. Xi Jinping is, a, you know, outliers, right? I mean, not Xi Jinping, it's Zhou Xiwei. Zhou Xiwei, Zhou Xiwei. Sorry, yeah, Zhou Xiwei. Xi Jinping in the KMT, yeah. that would be that would have been a disaster, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so okay. Xi Wei is an outsider right. out there. So he he does not really, you know, is not really influential at all. But he can make little splits, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, just make you guys, you know, suffer a little bit. So he, he's out there. And regarding Han Guoyu, I think Han Guoyu is uh, ambitious about coming back 
So let's that, that that's actually a little bit of a later topic. So mm-hmm. let's get back to that in a minute. Um, just very quickly, mm-hmm. <laughs> Choshi Wei. <laughs> How, how is this guy still around and mm. anybody listening to him? He was a one term right. Taipei County commissioner. Right. Uh, <laughs> the, his own party bumped him out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I actually saw him on a horse once and the horse tried to throw him off. <laughs> um, anyway, I've met him a few times. Um, but why is anybody still listening to this guy? Well, Zhou Xiwei, you can view Zhou Xiwei as a affiliation with Hong Xiuzhu. Mm-hmm. And Zhou Xiwa himself looked up to Han Guoyu. Right. And he, he really admired the pattern of Han Guoyu's rising. Okay. Right? But Han Guoyu did not really view him as an important aid because Zhou Xiwa himself is, you know, is limited. I mean, mm-hmm. his utility is very limited right now. Yeah. So Zhou Xiwa is kind of out there. Mm-hmm. And whenever, you know, like in the U.S. presidential election, you always have those kind of you know, kind of, kind of hangers um, on, hangers on yeah. over there, right? So he's that type of person. Because I noticed him during the mayoral election, during the presidential, mm-hmm. he was yeah. everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Yes, and it's like, why are they? This yeah. guy was not popular. He right. didn't do a good job. Yeah. And don't ever forget that Han Guoyu <laughs> was in the same position in the very first place yeah. in a KMT election. Remember, mm-hmm. not uh, until he kind of coming out of nowhere in Kaohsiung in twenty eighteen. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same same so, situation. So, okay, so Johnny Chang, at the end of the day, just before the party congress, dropped the proposal to drop the 1992 consensus. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I saw that there was an internal KMT party poll of their members, Mm -hmm. which showed, I think it was 82% of the party members still supported the 92 consensus. So it was pretty obvious he wasn't going to get it through the party congress. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, did he have anything to say to you about it or anything you saw that he said in public about this that you thought was revealing or? Well, Johnny, I think he really faced a difficulty of totally entirely dismissing 92 consensus because when he does that, he cannot even continue his position Mm -hmm. as a chairman. Right. So like what I said earlier, he has to compromise. Okay. So the number one, number two. But also, on the other hand, we have to specify who is going to go against him. And those people are influential. Because if you have people like Hong Xiu Zhu or Zhou Xiu against him, it doesn't matter to him. Mm-hmm. But people like Ma Yingjiu, people like Zhu Lilun, or even people like Han Guoyu mm-hmm. against him, that will you know, uh, bring him in a, in, in, into trouble. So he has to consider these people. Right? So... And, and for my angel's perspective, my, my angel is a stubborn supporters of United Consensus, even though that term <laughs> is not brought up by well, him. His, his legacy kind of depends. That's on his it. legacy. That's yeah. how he identify himself, how he still continue to feel that he exists in the mm-hmm. Taiwan's politics, right? So my angel is very grumpy about any possibility to remove 92 consensus. So my angel told Zhang Chizhen that you will never, ever do this mm-hmm. if you still want my help. Right. On my supports. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so I think John Tison finally came to a action where he come back to the native consensus. But if it's still in the original form that will make people look down to John by saying that you have no change at all. So that is why my uh John Tison asked my angel that if I put um individual interpretation mm-hmm. of what's one China, put that prior to Ninety consensus, you know. In English, we say without the uh, preposition or precondition of the individual interpretation, then we don't have the ninety consensus. Mm-hmm. And do you, my angel, agree with this? My angel said, "Yes, I can do this." So there's a new kind of brand, so so to speak. Sort of, sort yeah. of, sort of. Even to yeah. me, it's like not far enough. Right. You know, still, still deficient. But you think about the struggle for Jiang Chi Sun in sure. a domestic KMT party, mm-hmm. that's an inevitable consequence for him. Okay. But for us, we think about if you want to win the real election, I mean electoral, ele- I mean the uh, legislative election or even the presidential election, you have to go w- way further than that. Right. Mm-hmm. So so that's not enough. But anyway, so he survived. Yeah. So he 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 gained the support from Ma Injo and Ma Injo did not like Han Guoyu. He also gained the support from Zhu Lidun because everybody else 
do not like Zhu Lin now. Eric Chu, yeah. Eric Chu, because he's Eric Chu is the second is, most popular guy in the right, party. Because he's very calculated. I mean, he calculates a lot. <laughs> Even it's actually excessively that to the point that he sacrificed his his own chance in 2016. Yeah. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. So that's Jiang's uh Jiang kind of uh plays himself in this impossible position, but you know, with the possibility that everybody supports him. Mm -hmm. And it, he kind of gained that point, mm -hmm. which outsiders don't really, you know, you know, uh, are are aware of this. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people look down to KMD, think that he would go to, uh, you know, demise, you know, sooner or later. But, you know, trust me, if you look at a poll, the worst parts, the, 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 the best version, the worst version, always 25% of the people. No matter how you tease them, you, you make fun of them, saying that they are old-fashioned, they could be like a zombie in Taiwan's mm -hmm. party. They're still there. Yeah. And 25%, they will never be gone. Well, and even eventually, though, they will. <laughs> they'll be gone by the next generation. They are pretty old. <laughs> they are pretty old, but the next generation will inherit from their ideology. Otherwise, we would not have had you know, people like Wang Binzhong, you know, the, the young, the young uh, YouTuber that totally for China, right? Mm -hmm. So, so... Uh, that's also the crisis for for KMT is that they still think that no matter what, there's a small segments of population there in support of, of of us. But to me, this is about timing. Sooner or later, somebody will replace you guys. For example, uh, 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 TPP, right? Min Zhongdang, led by Ke Wenzhe, because Ke Wenzhe is kind of a craving the electoral support space of KMT. Mm -hmm. Inch by inch, he will eat up those. So so you, you guys cannot stay there and, and think that you are still in a safe scenario. That's wrong. Yeah. I think that's a future show for us. Right. <laughs> I'd love to talk about the TPP and all that. Um, so, okay. So the um, let's move on to who might be running for party chair in August of 2021. So the, the reason for the date is that there was a, the last time when Hong Xiuju passed it off to Wu Duanyi, there was some weird conflict over like the party Congress and, and mm -hmm. the swearing in the ceremony. And so they changed the date for internal mm -hmm. logic reasons. Um, mm -hmm. They switched it from May 20th to, I forget the date, but it's in August. Mm -hmm. um, now there's been a lot of speculation about who will be running for party chair in mm -hmm. August of 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, ob obviously, main candidates that people have been talking about, I think, are Johnny Chang himself, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Chu, mm -hmm. possibly Hou Yui, mm -hmm. um, Han Guoyu, mm -hmm. and Ma ying -jou. These are the ones I keep hearing over mm -hmm. and over again. Now, I, I my theory on kind of getting back to something uh, you were talking about a moment ago, about why Eric Chu and Ho Yui and these guys, I think particularly Eric Chu, and this is a calculating thing, mm -hmm. why he was supportive of Johnny Chang mm -hmm. continuing as party chair is because he knows that the reforms that Johnny Chang is trying to get through mm -hmm. are painful and hard, and he himself is hoping that Johnny Chang gets those done so that he doesn't get, mm -hmm. so he doesn't take any blame for it mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. That's right. my theory. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. So, of the of that list, is there any any are there any other major candidates that you, that you can think of? Or well, first that... of all, uh, President Main Job is out. I mean, like what I said, he's grumpy. Only if uh, the whole KMT uh, dumping. The 92 consensus. If that's still, if the 92 consensus is still around, no matter in what form, and he's okay with that. So I don't think Mindjo is joining the uh, next uh, chairman election. No, but what I, the, here's the thing that makes that gives me pause is he keeps coming out. He's been very pub, very high profile mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. and in a way that looks like he's campaigning for something. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's campaigning for something. He just well, craves public attention or that's first of all, he, he I kind of feel he, he I kind of feel he lost in 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 a sense of power. Kind of he feel inefficient in controlling something mm -hmm. anymore. So he's nervous. Mm. He's upset. He's uneasy about about this kind of uh kind of power impotence. 
sort of speaking, right? So that's his thing. And the second thing, I think my angel still want to continue his legacy in whatever form, as long as there is some kind of politicians, younger one especially, can clinch to his brand. He's mm -hmm. happy about it. Right. So he himself does not need to do something personally, but he can just extend or, or continue this legacy by letting other people do this. Right. So that's my feeling. And practically, my angel doesn't really do, doesn't do things that he has no chance to win. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, he's pretty, pretty pragmatic as well. I mean, don't ever forget that he will never lose the one election in the past. That's true. All throughout his, his, his political life, he's, he was pretty successful. Okay, so com coming back to who is the hopeful candidates, I think Zhu Lilun, Eric, mm -hmm. Zhu, Han Guoyu, mm -hmm. you know, eventually I think he, 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 will, he will come out, uh, you know, to, to acknowledge that his qualification for this position. Hou Yui is a possibility. Mm -hmm. And I think Hou Yui, Hou Yui, if KMT really ever wants to come back to the ruling uh, a power in 2024, Hou Yui is definitely the only and also the number one candidates, which maybe Zhang Jisen himself might uh, uh, help Hou to mm -hmm. win the election. You know, as far as I know that Zhang Jisen himself is not, first of all, he's too young. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's not young to be 40, <laughs> 48. Come on, could be could be a grandfather already, right? <laughs> but but according to Kemdi's logic, you yeah. know, he's still too young, yeah. right? And but you know, to be fair, he's younger than Tsai Ing-wen, than Su Zhen Zhang, than than those old folks. Mm -hmm. So he's young, right? So he is, he can wait. Yeah. So he can help somebody to win the 2024. And a more practical option is Hoyo Yi. Mm -hmm. And the second kind of option, of course, is Eric Chu. Yeah. So Eric Zhu is very ambitious, you know, and sometimes he cannot really conceal his ambition. People can feel <laughs> that all the time. He's already set up a policy planning right. thing. And yeah. Yeah. No, he's so, so in Zhu, in Eric Zhu's calculation, he thinks that he might have a chance to support Jiang to win the next chairman election, mm -hmm. but then in turn help himself to run the presidential election in 2024. Oh, you that, kill him though. Yeah, that's that's his calculation. <laughs> that is yeah. his calculation, which I think is too much calculation. That in the end you wins nothing. Yeah, yeah, you can better stay at home and just becomes a <laughs> a different person instead of a politician. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think on that we'll uh, wrap up the program. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for invi inviting me over the show. Yeah. All right, well, we'll do another time. show uh, sometime in the future, and. Um, and I hope everybody uh, learned a lot. I certainly did. And of course, check check out report.tw and check us out on Facebook and YouTube for this kind of irregular show, Taiwan Context. And uh, hopefully you'll be back also to listen to Taiwan Report News Brief. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw. Taiwan Gola.